Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. The top heavy from the top down government. And I said, God, you got to give us some answers for where we're at. He said, what I'm going to do is not from the top down. It's going to be from the bottom up. You can change the world from your living room. I said, you can change the world from your living room. I look back at my own history and I think, you know, Ben has been on the mountain that we pretty much own now. And on that hill was just a man and his wife and seven kids. My sister said the other Sunday morning, she said we was drug babies. We was drugged to church on Sunday, on Wednesday. You know. <laughs> but while we, were, while we were being raised, building a church, God was building something in a family. Because the first thing we can do, see, what, as long as there's something outside of us that we're looking for as the answer, we never have to do anything. Let, let, let's, well, let's blame the government. Come on. But how many know the government is only an expression of the smallest of units from the bottom up? Oh, y'all don't want to help me this morning. This is practical, but I believe it's important. See, what I think we need to realize is that God is challenging us that not only, see, we can, you know, my mother-in-law is 90 years old and she is starting to get dementia. She, her husband was a mentor to me. So we kind of take care of her. She doesn't live with us, but she comes to my house every day and eats lunch with us or eats supper. We make sure she has it. And her and I go into the living room and we watch Little House on the Prairie. And I'm sitting there watching Little House on the Prairie and I'm thinking, man, this was back when TV was good. It was teaching them, it was teaching even things like how to be empathetic towards your neighbor, how, how to... To, it dealt with issues like racial reconciliation and even at that time among Indians and so forth and stuff like that. And all of a sudden the Lord said to me, listen, there's a lot of stuff flooding the minds of our young people. But how many know that whoever can flow, flow, controls the flow of information is also going to uh, control the minds of people? So it's what you put into the minds that counts. And I'm telling you, there is a flood coming out of the dragon's mouth. That's why I think it is so vastly important. You say, Brother House, give us something practical. Tell me something practical that can change my world. Let me look straight at this camera because there's probably a lot of people watching. I shared it across all my social media. Get off the couch, get dressed, get your family ready, and get to a church that's preaching the gospel. That's the first thing you can do. A friend of mine shared some statistics with me. He said that when, 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 when a child is the first one to get saved in a family, 3% of the family come in. When the mother's the first one to get saved, 17% of the family comes in and serves God. But when the father gets saved, 93%. Come on, I'm talking to somebody here this morning. So you could say, well, mom, you get them dressed and you take them to church, but then the babies are sitting there, the, or the kids are saying, but dad don't have to go. Somebody said, well, I ain't going to make my kid go to church. You make them go to school. You make them brush their teeth. You make them wash behind their ears. Come on, somebody. I know I'm preaching all right this morning. What I'm saying is it's time for us to be leaders, first of all, over our own self and let the kingdom govern me individually, and then I need to bring God back in my home. You say, well, I don't have a local church like Calvary. Well, the very first thing you can do is, if nothing else, sit down with your family and start to teach them the word of God. I, my, my pastor said to me the, back some time ago, someone came and asked her this. This was an adult. Ask her this question. How did they drag that ark of Noah all across that desert into the promised land? Now, y'all looking at me funny. But that person thought the ark of the covenant that Moses carried was that big boat that Noah built. Now, now we laugh at that, but that tells me somebody has not been to Sunday school. Well, they might teach my kids bad stuff. I learned some bad stuff, too, that I had to unlearn. But I learned the Bible stories. 
I even look back at the days of legalism whenever, come on, they were preaching stuff that was really browbeat. And, I, and the Lord said to me one time, he said, uh, I said, Lord, why did you let me learn all that mess? He said, because he said, even though you've been called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, I let you learn the ways of the Egyptians so you can systematically set my people free. I know how they think. I even take that as education. It wasn't hindered. I'm like the apostle Paul. He said at the feet of Gamaliel. But once the revelation of Jesus came, he began to shift everything. And all of a sudden, stuff began to change. See, I want to tell you what he begins to say, even in the book that I wrote, Unforced Rhythms of Grace. He says, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you burned out on religion? Watch this. I have thrilled a many a crowd by preaching that. But the rest of it says, walk with me. Work with me. This is a unique father-son relationship. It's family. But I'm not going to keep it to myself. I'm going to go over it line by line with you. He said, because if you will walk with me and work with me, you will recover your life. I will teach you the unforced rhythms of grace. Let me show you another verse, Romans 5. He says here in the message again, here it is in a nutshell. One man did it wrong and got us in all this trouble with sin and death, and another man did it right and got us out of it. Touch your neighbor and say, you're not in trouble this morning. But that's not all it says. It said, but more than get us out of trouble, he got us into a life. Romans 12 in the Message Bible says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring your everyday walking around, going to school, going to work, going to the store life and place it before me as a sacrifice and say, this is where it all begins. See, I think what we've done is got so distracted and we've got so confused with the culture. He says in Romans 12, if you read that in the Message Bible, it says don't get, don't get caught up in the culture of your day where it starts to take over your life. But stop assuming an outward expression that does not come from within you. So what God does is he starts his pro project by putting something inside of me. And then there's this outworking in everyday life. See, I think we've forgotten or we almost think it's legalistic if we say things like, we need to have good, solid commitment. Somebody said, I mean, it's just confusion everywhere. I think even in gray circles, well, should we tithe? Should we not tithe? Here's the bottom line. What you don't support goes away. I don't care if it's your baseball team. And be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he'll also reap. That's not just finances. That's how you treat people around you. I gave some of the worst waitresses uh, uh, that I had this year the biggest tips. And at times when I would do that, they would begin to weep and start to share with me some problems they were having in their life because you never know what they're going through. Oh, y'all don't want to help me preach. I'm talking about practical stuff. I'm talking about lay the cell phone down, get off of social media and listen to what your teenage daughter or teenage son is saying. Put some cyber checks on them. Say, they're going to look at me and say, you don't trust me. Say, you better believe it. I was a teenager too. <laughs> and this is too dangerous of a world. Come on, for you to be just set. Come on, y'all. They got things. They're facing things that I don't even know nothing about. As, look, I'm just learning some of this because I got grandkids. They're smarter than I am on a cell phone. Y'all hear what I'm talking about? And begin to realize, somebody say, well, you know, Brother, brother House, I don't, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to tithe or give you know, for God to love me. That's true. You don't. You don't have to pay your house payment either. <laughs> God won't be mad at you if you don't pay your house payment. But somebody else will be living in your house next week. <laughs> I'm talking about sons, not children and slaves. I'm talking about sons who realize the world to come was not put in subjection to angels. It was put in subjection to sons who are co-heirs with him and joint heirs as God begins his new creation project. Can I tell you that when they began to restore Jerusalem under Ezra and Nehemiah, they started to return and they started to sing, for the Lord is good. 
for his mercy endures forever. And they started to establish worship and singing that carried with it an understanding of grace. And then as they progressed in the building, it started with some few people. Sometimes it's overwhelming, Pastor Ben, because most of the church thinks, let's just let the sky fall. Let's just let it all fall apart. And we, we, we preach a losing Jesus rather than maybe we're the answer, but some few men. I said some few men came with Ezra and Nehemiah at first. And when they started to see God was doing something, they began to get letters from the other side of the river. Can I tell you, I came today with a prophetic word from the other side of the river. And I came to tell you, I, I'm prophesying, resources are coming. I'm telling you, resources are coming. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, resources are coming for Calvary. They're coming for your business. They're coming for you. I'm telling you, the resources are coming. I need somebody to hear what I'm preaching because what you preach will manifest. Timber started coming. Rock cures started coming. People who knew how to build started coming. The things you needed started showing up. When you take a step, somebody gets on board with you. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden, stuff starts to shift. And then it goes on to say this. And the family of so-and-so built this section of the wall. And the family of this section built next unto him on this section of the wall. And then another family joined and said, let's build this section of the wall. And then this family joined and they built next to this gate and they started to build. And I heard God say, get your family and get on the wall and build something redemptive in the earth. Your walls shall be called salvation and your gates shall be called praise. Hallelujah. Zechariah declared, return unto me, you prisoners of hope. Because you're about to be restored. Come on, in the day of trouble, he declared that. Come on, stand on your feet all over this room today. I want to bring this in as I begin to make some prophetic declarations. I prophesy and declare God's going to begin to cause, come on, men. First of all, I want to speak over men and just prophesy. God, give them the courage. Let me pray. Give them the courage to rise up and be what they're called to be. God, I pray for families. I pray for families to be restored and renewed. I pray for children to come back into the household. Hallelujah. I declare prophetically God is building something in your house and in your family. Even in the midst of COVID, one of the mayors of northern Pennsylvania said, to one of my pastor friends, we are bracing for a lot of domestic violence because of people being shut in. And at first there was domestic violence. He said, but after a little while, the domestic violence began to diminish and marriages started being restored because for the first time, you don't have to take the kids to soccer practice. I don't have to take them to music practice. You don't have to run here. Let me tell listen, we got to find a balance between some of this stuff because we've taught our kids how to play, but we haven't taught them how to pray. I'm going to say that again. I said we taught them how to play what we hadn't taught them how to pray. So they know how to compete, but they don't know how to get a hold of God when a crisis hits. And we're not, are y'all hearing me this morning? Pray with them at the table. Pray with them before they get on the school bus. Declare some things over them prophetically. And he said, the mayor said that they begin to lay their cell phones down and talk to each other at supper and at a table. My children are, my youngest is 40 but I still speak to them like a father. I have a six, seven hundred pastors at least that I communicate with in a private forum, and I speak to them like a father. I came here today to speak like a father and to speak prophetically. And say so there's some adjustments that I believe God wants to make in our lives. And as we get ready to sing something here in just a moment, I want to open this front if you feel something stirring in your heart that says, listen, I'm not talking about a New Year's resolution. I'm talking about you're looking for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. See, this is not about a country club or some new, uh, you know, New Year's resolution. We're simply saying, I'm going to present my body as a living sacrifice. Again, from the Message Bible, my walking around everyday life. I'm just presented to God and I'm saying, listen, Holy Spirit, you do in me and in my family what I cannot do for myself, but I'm going to participate with you as a co-joint heir 
And as for me and my house, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to get committed to my marriage, to my business, to my local church, to my family. If I've got any men in the house that feel like that, won't you step out of your chair and say, as for me and my house. Let's make, this, let's make this a New Year's prophetic declaration. As for me and my house. You can bring your family with you if you'd like. As for me and my house. I think we can make those kinds of determinations. Once again, I'm not making this a Sunday where I hope it's not coming off legalistic. I'm just talking about you can change the world from your living room. I learned how to prophesy at home devotions. Learned how to preach, preaching to my siblings at a home devotions. We built a church there on the hill now. And on that mountain that that family, not knowing that my dad, who really was one of the, was the, the key leader, I mean, God made a miraculous. People ask me a lot of times, what is your background, Dr. Howes? I said, well, I was a heathen. What was yours? My, great, my grandmother was a bootleg whiskey salesman. You could burn it in the car or drink it. It was they called it White Lightning or Sneaky Pete. Some of you know, probably drank some of it. <laughs> but when my daddy gave his heart to Jesus, it shifted our family being notorious for criminal activity in our town to becoming the main spiritual resource of our whole county with my brother, my sister, and our family. And that little family on a hill of seven kids that was like a wild bunch grew up and now people come to that hill from all over the world and our TV broadcast touches a hundred and some million homes in the U.S. because the daddy got out of bed and took his kids to church when there was seven of us. When my wife said to me, I... At times when you were traveling, I went on Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and I got our kids and went to school, or not to school, to church. I hear young people say, well, you know, we got kids. We can't come and help and work at the church. I said, how do you think we raised you? We also learned some skills while we were doing it. We learned, come on, how to manage relationships. I learned how to lay block, build a wall, wire a socket. Come on. A lot of stuff that saved me a lot of money came because I was helping on Saturday. Come on, somebody. Y'all don't want to help me preach. I'm challenging the next generation as well. I say this to pastors over the world. I hope this is not coming across legalistic, but I just, this is just observations that I can say because I'm not a pastor. When I go to church dinners, my generation, we show up. We got fried chicken, mashed potatoes. Uh, we got tea and a cake and coleslaw. Next generation shows up, they got a two liter Pepsi and a bag of potato chips that they picked up on the way to church. They're going to take three plates home and then get up and leave you clean up the mess. I'm challenging the next generation to step up. In many churches, the support that's coming, that's keeping churches floating, are coming from people who are coming to their retirement age. Where we've raised a generation that are making way more money than us that I've never learned the principles. I'm not talking about you got to do nothing. I'm talking about, see, I, I'm a mess this morning, Pastor Ben. Psalm 50 said, did I ever ask you for the blood of bulls or the fat of rams? Do you think I ever had pleasure in burnt sacrifices and rams? He said, all the fowls of the mountain are already mine and the cattle on a thousand hills, I already own it. And if I was hungry, I would never ask you. I preached a message a few Sundays ago called, What If God Was Hungry? And what God was saying in that is not that I ever wanted your offering. What I was looking for is your heart in it. I put something in the arena of your human expression to be able to obey me. It's that simple. Because I never delighted in the fat of rams, nor was I ever hungry for the blood of bulls. I just gave you something that didn't cost you anything so you could give it back to me because your heart was in it. And he said, I'm not away with your new moons and your Sabbaths. If I was hungry, do you think I need cows? Do you think I need your money? I don't need it. But you need to have something that you can respond to God by saying, let me be obedient in what you're telling me to do. 
And I believe all over this room, I think as we get ready to sing something in worship, let's recommit this morning. Let's declare, I'm going to present myself to God as a living sacrifice and let him do in me and through me. Hallelujah. What he wants to do. I'm going to, as the man of my house, lead. I'm going to lead. I'm going to, I'm going to, listen, I know there are people, and I understand that, that, I understand that there are people who aren't able to come and their sickness and all that. But listen, I'm telling you, I think sometimes if you can go to Walmart, you can go to a football game, you can go to the theater, you can get out of bed and come to church. Well, I don't want to go there because all they want is my money. That's all Walmart wants, and you go right there and lay it right down. Well, I don't know how to do it online. You know how to work Amazon. My four-year-old granddaughter got her mom's phone, four years old. She ordered herself a Minnie Mouse bed and sheets and covers, showed up, ordered them, put them in the cart, paid for them, and they show up at the house. Four years old, they know how to work it. What I'm simply saying is, listen, I believe it's time to quit playing. As if this, I, I, I trust that this is not coming across legalistically, but as a chiropractic adjustment that says, we're going to change the world, but we're going to start one person at a time. Come on, sing something all over this room. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, step out of your chairs if you feel like this this morning. And let's just offer this morning, I'm not asking you to put anything tangible on the altar. I'm just asking you to say, I'm, I'm presenting myself as a living sacrifice. Let, let's start this year as saying, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. And what you'll be surprised at is that he's not going to abuse you or take advantage of you. As a matter of fact, probably what he'll lead you into is going to give you the most joy you've ever had. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because we were made for community. And when we're the happiest is when we're serving each other. Go ahead. God was hungry. If God was hungry, could he ask me? He's hungry this morning. Open ourselves this morning. We say yes. Lord, I declare prophetically over this house and over all of those that are listening that this is a season of great reformation. Not just revival, but reformation. Instead of planning for demise, we are going to rise and build. I prophesy provision is coming. We've got a letter from the other side of the river. Hallelujah. That resources are on the way. Somebody receive it for yourself today, for your family. I feel like there's healing in this room. I feel like there are some 
bad reports that have come in, but God is about to turn it around. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Signs and wonders and divers gifts of the Holy Ghost are going to manifest in our services and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah is going to begin to take the forefront and begin to get his rightful place. God's going to heal some marriages and some families. Let me read this prophetically over you as I get ready to turn it back to Pastor Ben. This is actually the text from Romans 12. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. This is coming from the greatest grace preacher on ever walked, Paul the Apostle. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me and especially as I have responsibility in relation to you, living then as every one of you does in pure grace. It's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God is bringing it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are or what we do for him. In this way, we are like the parts, the various parts of the human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as part of this body, but as chopped off finger or cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellent form, marvelously functioned parts of Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be. We were made to be a part of a body. We find our greatest expression as we're a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. Stop letting the culture dictate what goes on in our lives. There's an absolute agenda. Come on, sometimes you need to turn the channel. You need to moderate what your kids are watching. And on and on it goes. But in the midst of it, he's simply saying, this is not just a New Year's resolution. This is simply presenting yourself and saying, God wants to do some things in and through me. And I just want to allow it. Come on, put your hands together as Pastor Ben and Ken come out. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.